suspected was coming. Sorry, that word took a second. <laughs> what, we thought, what we thought might be coming, what we, what we imagined might be coming, what was kind of whispered out there, and it became announced and shouted from the rooftops. What kind of things? Well, things like counterfeit creation, social robots in an age of social distance, the metaverse, what the World Economic Forum is telling us about that, human 2.0, media in the brain, the great merge, and the God delusion, the idea that we can become gods. I can't say too much about these things or I'll spend the whole afternoon just telling you what's in those and then we'll never get to the content of the afternoon. But uh, I, will, I will mention that this idea of the spiritual machines becoming a, a completely surrendering to and the literal worship of artificial intelligence is coming. And I know some of the things in technocracy are going to sound crazy, but it's just what they are saying. It would never be some speculation of some person. It needs to be documented if we're going to do current events and prophecy responsibly. Um, number nine is the high-tech thought police, and then 10, the climactic climate crisis. So having said all of that, of what we're going to be touching on this afternoon, I want to begin with a clip. Now this is going to be our test because we're doing things a little differently with our uh, AV department. There's no sound from my computer, so we switch over from mine to the house computer and the, and the video will play for the, for the group in here and those online. And so hopefully it will be a pretty quick transition each time we need to go to a clip. We'll see how it goes. But I want you to hear from a farewell address from a House, former president of the, president of the United, of the United States, States, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Dwight D. Eisenhower. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. So if a scientific technological elite were to capture public policy, in other words, engage in social engineering upon a society according to the dictates of that very elite, that would be broadly defined as a technocracy, no longer a society of freedom with the two lambs horns, civil and religious liberty in the American constitutional republic, it would transition from that to rule by the technocratic elite, by the technicians, by the experts, by those who hold those positions of corporate and bureaucratic power. That was something that was hinted at, what would be that be now, 60 years ago. 60 years ago, it was not only the military industrial complex, and we could talk about the geopolitical aspects of that, but the main part I wanted to share, which a lot of people don't talk about from the Eisenhower, Eisenhower farewell address, he warned f about the dangers in America of a scientific technological elite capturing public policy. Let's think about that as we go forward and see has that transpired. Well, there's been much talk for the last 30 plus years at least, but also going back to the early 20th century, authors like H.G. Wells and others foreshadowing, calling for, and attempting to, through roundtable groups and other secret societies or just flat out announcements and, and publications from the power elite, build what they call a world government, or often goes by the, the nomenclature of a new world order. Now this was fascinating to me because in, the, in, in 2020, this year, this summer, this is one of those examples about, I'm so glad this series was delayed because so much new information came out. For example, just the announcement of world government. We're going to have a summit called the world government that was a major globalist uh, sort of uh, confab. And at this summit, they, and they asked the question, really made the announcement of what is now here. And I want to roll that clip right now. Okay, we'll skip that one. It goes, the, uh, it's the announcement of the opening session for the World Government Summit, and it's simply the question, are we Highnesses, ready? Highnesses, Excellencies, it is. ladies and gentlemen, a very, very good morning on what is the first official day of World Government Summit here at Dubai Expo 2020. And the title of this session, are we ready for a new world order? CNBC published an article, A New World Order is Emerging and the World is Not Ready for It. Are we ready for a new world order? For the new world order is how they put it in the article, but it was a uh, new in the, in the, you heard it. 
a provoc the provocative title of the panel that led off the ambitiously named World Government Summit, that is a pretty ambitious name, here last week, was framed to suggest that a new global order is emerging and the world is not ready for it. Now, I want to use the World Government Summit that was held in 2022 as sort of the outline for much of what we're going to walk through this afternoon together. Because on their website, they had all these little inserts of, you know, heading and what we're all about. Here's another heading. Here's what we're all about. Here's another heading. Here's what we're all about. So if you want to understand the globalist technocracy, you kind of go category by category and you get some pretty good hints and not needing to theorize or engage in any sort of conspiratorial speculation. The first thing is, in highlighted in blue there, they refer to the age of what? Can you read that from where you are? Interdependence, a new blueprint for governments. So we're going to have a different form of how governance takes place, and we're going to call it the age of interdependence. Now remember those two concepts as we go forward, because I've got to do a little history for you to get, see how we got to this phrase interdependence and what they're talking about with a new kind of government. Well, I want to take you back just a few years first, and then we'll go back a little further than that. But do you remember 2015, the announcement of the 2030 Agenda? This was a huge global announcement, major, a new agenda for a sustainable world. And the big wig who missed uh, the UN um, G uh, Secretary General announced it as, I call Agenda 2030 our declaration of what? Can you read it from there? Wait a minute. I've heard of the Declaration of Independence. I've never heard of the Declaration of Interdependence. What are you referring to? Well, Mr. Ban highlighted the vital need to engage with more com uh, companies to reach the agenda's 17 sustainable development goals. So the 2030 agenda was a United Nations uh, blueprint for 17 things we want to achieve by the year 2030. And I call the agenda our Declaration of Interdependence. Now, if you were to uh, pinpoint one institution, entity, upon the earth, and I'm not talking about Satan himself, of course, who would be number one, but who would be most inclined to want to replace the Declaration of Independence with something else, anything else? Well, guess who was the biggest promoter of the Declaration of Interdependence? By the way, this is not a slam on people who happen to be Catholic. All the Catholic people I know are like, our Marxist Pope is embarrassing. That's what they say, okay? I'm not saying that. But, so this is not a slam on Catholics. I love everybody from all religions, faiths, walks of life, races, nations, etc. But in an address to the United Nations General Assembly in New York today, Pope Francis spoke at length on a range of subjects from equity and the environmental protection to the promotion of the rule of law and eradicating global poverty. In this, the fifth time that a pope has visited the UN, Pope Francis also highlighted the importance of the, there it is, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development set to be adopted by UN member states later this morning, that was the news in 2015, and the upcoming climate conference in Paris, where they ultimately got their Paris Climate Agreement, your sustainable development goals. We're going to come all, back to all that environmental stuff in just a minute. But just suffice it to say now that the 2030 agenda is really a Vatican project and, 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 at, at its essence. You might say it's a United Nations. Well, what is the United Nations? I mean, it isn't as much of an entity in itself as it is there are corporate powers, intergovernmental powers, global elites, and most prominently the Pope of Rome at the wellspring of that. So the Declaration of Inter Interdependence is on the way in, which means the other declaration is on the way out. By the way, is that just some sort of you know, nationalistic, rah, rah, I love America type of thing to say? In the book, The Great Controversy, it quotes the Declaration of Independence at length, and it refers to it as that grand old document. So when you read in Revelation 13 about the nation that was to arise around the time that the Pope was taken captive in 1798 at the end of the 1,260 years, and a nation that would arise in a place that was not as heavily populated as where that first beast was from, you come to an understanding that Revelation 13 is talking about the second beast being America, literally America, that will speak like a dragon in the last days. But before the verse about him speaking like a dragon, what does it describe this beast as being like? Like a lamb, with two horns as a lamb, as I was saying earlier. So when you look at the founding era, there, 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 there's no period of human governance where you can find perfect human performance. You find that in the Garden of Eden. 
God's theocracy. You find that in heaven, God's order and rule. But as far as when in the course of human events it becomes necessary to throw off the shackles of tyranny and establish a nation of, of independence, a nation of freedom based upon principles that would extend those freedoms to every class, race, and gender in society. I shouldn't say every gender. I, I, I slipped into how the culture talks about the. Are there more than two? Uh, anyway, you caught me on that. <laughs> Suffice it to say, America was birthed with that, those lamb-like qualities even at a time of the, of, of oppression of, of slaves, even at a time where woman, women couldn't yet vote. But the principles in the Declaration of Independence were that which gave birth to extending those freedoms to all. So we celebrate that. We don't just say, well, that was at a time that they didn't get it all right, so let's cast aside the Declaration of Independence. It's that grand old document. Never let that go. We hold these truths to be self-evident, said Martin Luther King Jr., quoting the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, that we are endowed by our Creator by certain unalienable rights, and that among among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So who else is promoting the 2030 agenda? Well, of course, the World Economic Forum. If you haven't heard of them yet, you have, but you may have forgotten you heard of them because <laughs> they've been everywhere announcing their intentions globally. Davos, the World Economic Forum, is seeking to accelerate, among other things, the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. What is the World Economic Forum? A gathering, or maybe you say the gathering publicly, of the world's most wealthy and powerful globalists, including industry, academia, entertainment. You get the musicians out there going back to media on the brain with Bono, meeting with the presidents, meeting with the public. Hope you remember that whole scenario. Leonardo DiCaprio involved in the World Economic Forum. A lot of big entertainers, uh, not just the musicians and the entertainers, but the big corporate elites, the, uh, the, the big tech executives, you name it. Basically, it's a who's who who gather together, form a consensus of what the globalist agenda will be going forward. Um, I should mention, by the way, the idea of, you know, that sounds like a conspiracy theory, a theorist. When, when I was uh, studying at, a, at the master's level in social sciences, I was, I was doing a term paper on the Bilderberg Group. That was when they were kind of keeping these things more secret. Uh, the World Economic Forum has just been the coming out, the uncloaking, like announcing the new world. Are we ready for a new world order? You know, that kind of thing where it's not really the, 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 the secret whispered things and the speculations that people engage in. But on the paper that I wrote, I simply wanted to quote the public statements that prominent members of that Bilderberg group had engaged in in announcing what they were trying to build for the world. And uh, it was interesting to engage at that level in academia and, and encounter pushback from the professor leadership level, but the fellow students being like, whoa, this is interesting. Why have I never heard this before? There are whole stories to be told about that. I won't tell you all the story of, of my walk through that journey, but I will point out a screenshot from a World Economic Forum video, Global Elites Plan for Your Future. I would have th thought you'd take that screenshot from some YouTuber who's, you know, World Economic Forum or, you know, corporate globalists are planning your, your future. No, no, no. This was from a World Economic Forum video. Cheek, screenshot that. That's the idea here, the globalist power brokers. This is Henry Kissinger on the left there and his, his uh, protege, Klaus Schwab who is the president of the World Economic Forum. He's the one you might have heard in the video clips going around with the German accent. We'll get back to him. But in the 1970s, he was studying under Kissinger. And if you don't know Kissinger, a little bit about geopolitical history, he's the biggest New World Order guy of the bunch. I mean, he spoke of it and, and worked for it for a generation at that level. But um, back to the sustainable development goals. What was the 2030 agenda saying they wanted to do? Here is, the, the, in their words, next to the red arrow transforming our world. Now, I know a God who's going to transform this world. I know that that's really going to transpire. But for human beings to say, we're going to ascend the structures and ladder of power, and the whole world is going to be transformed. Every nation will be transformed. This would be, if they were to achieve it, the biggest, most ambitious social engineering feat in human history, you can't find a time where that actually transpired. Is this just talk? Is this just utopian dreams? Is this just a pipe dream? Well, let's look at what 
others have said about these 17 sustainable development goals that include new forms of governance as the World Government Summit announced, partnerships and interdependence with all different levels of the bureaucracy, with the corporate establishments, and with the non-governmental institutions. What could this look like? Well, part of it is wealth redistribution. When you read through the 17 goals, you hear sort of that socialistic Marxist influence of redistribution within nations and among nations. That's been around since the beginning of the United Nations. But I found an actual communist say something very interesting about the 2030 agenda. This is Robert Mugambe, the former dictator of Zimbabwe, which that's close to my family's heart uh, to, to recognize the nation that was turned upside down and more or less destroyed economically and as far as civil liberties and other liberties go. Uh, my wife was born in Zimbabwe as her parents were missionaries with, uh, at the time they were living there when my wife was born. And um, so they, they understand a little bit about, about Zimbabwe from firsthand experience. But here's what he had to say about the 2030 agenda. Agenda, promises a brave new world. Now, students of history who know a little bit about like dystopian fiction literature, which I don't recommend we read, by the way. People talk about 1984 and or Orwellian society and stuff. And yes, I've been there in, in the past. I used to teach classes on that. Today, I don't, I don't believe in, in promoting reading of dystopian fiction literature. Stick with that which is true and noble and right and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. But to refer to something as a brave new world is not paying it a compliment. <laughs> the brave new world was this futuristic society where freedoms vanish and people are under some mind control and it's this, you know, Aldous Huxley's version of Orwell's 1984 of what the future could look like under authoritarianism. He's saying that's what the 2030 agenda is. It's a brave new world. He called it a new world which we have to construct consciously, a new world that calls for the creation of a new, here's the concept, a global citizen. So much of the philosophy of this World Economic Forum, United Nations, Vatican, 2030 Agenda conglomerate is an annihilation of nationhood as we've known it. So you need to take down the individual citizenship concept of a nation, like a lamb-like nation that might for a time preserve liberty, and we want a global citizen. Beyonce actually had a video up on her, her uh, website that was promoting, hey, global citizens, we got to get behind the 2030 agenda. I won't play that clip because we're not able to do it all, but here's a George Soros publication, very important globalist billionaire. Um, he called the, the sustainable development goals, the 2030 agenda, he called it another great leap forward. Now, if there's anybody who...